be able to join me. And together we were able to like learn and go through the processes of critical pedagogy, thinking about transparency and teaching and learning during this difficult time. I was just reflecting really deeply about the purpose of classroom learning and how to build the communities as we're remote and then online. And with that, I also want to thank my colleagues. I've been learning a lot from them. Um, Sheridan and DLD, where, I, where I'm still um, working with and, and learning a lot from. Um, I had a Sprint student to work with me throughout the summer, Audrey, who helped to revise my class. And, um, and again, my students right now that I'm still learning, like even like new platforms and techniques and what works and what doesn't. So I wanted to make a note to just thank them for that. Um, so uh, just jumping into it, like, who am I? Um, these are a few, I was trying to hone into like a few of my teaching principles that shape who I am. As um, Fies has mentioned, um, uh, some of these are actually from my digital humanities background, uh, working with different digital humanities projects. Here you have one where I was working closely with Vietnam Archive in, at Michigan State. I also work with digital humanities at Berkeley and multimedia labs at Brown. And that gives me a certain, not just familiarity with digital collections and, and visual analysis, but really thinking a lot about public communication as um, within my courses. So I try to envision as we kind of do different types of assignments, we build up to the final paper, how do we, um, communicate this to the larger public. And, and that's still a work in progress, but it's just something that I build into my class. Like two other aspects that really shape how I, I design my classes. Um, during my time, when I was working in the Division of Undergrad edu Education at UCLA, I was part of this collaborative learning program, working with the undergraduate students there. And as I continue to learn and continue to develop my teaching, uh, I really strive to build a feedback-driven classroom thinking about different ways of building kind of low stakes experiments, both in self-assessment and being transparent about these, these types of assessments in our class. And then, especially now, as I think about just everything we're going through, community of practice and care, um, building a space that we can, and I show like my own care for my work, for my teaching, for my research, but also for one another, building in time to check in to kind of icebreakers and kind of reflective moments during class to just like take a breath and be transparent about what's going on. But also to show like my own like care and attention that I have for the type of scholarship I do. And I think like for me, I, I hope to model that with my teaching and my research for my students. So that's just a bit about who I am. A model that I'm trying to remind myself as uh, you know, um, we're just going through all of this in my both my research and my teaching is thinking about substance rather than addition or additive. Um, you know, for teaching, I think about like if I'm going to revise a class or add an assignment or add a reading, I really remind myself like, is this really substantive? Is this necessary for the class? Does this actually align with the core goals and principles of our class? Um, or is this really kind of non essential or feeling like? I'm just kind of modeling things I did before. So, you know, that's just something I'm reminding myself as I'm just <laughs> going through this semester. And I hope that it helps you to just, you know, as you hear these different suggestions that I mentioned to also think about like, you know, does this really add more to my class or is this a slight distraction? Does this like hone into the core goals? So even with kind of the examples that I'm using to just, just remind yourself that like, you know, take what you want and take what you feel is useful to you for your class and the core goals of your class. So kind of concretely, what does this look like in my classes? I have three focus points in my teaching. Um, right now it's looking at variation modality, and that is a kind of a fancy way of saying varying different types of engagements with one another. So that could be that um, engaging with both the material and also engaging with one another, either written, verbal, or listening. And with the variety of different kind of engagements with the text or with kind of different types of platforms, synchronous, asynchronous, uh, I, I create this community of practitioners. The second aspect that I try to focus in is one that I'm really trying hard still to work on, which is energy management. I called it time management first, but I think at this point it's just energy of how much energy it takes to just do 
to teach um, online, but also to like just write out the, all the different assignments and reminders and communication. It, it's a lot um, to read everything. I, I feel like I'm forgetting things because I'm just inundated with announcements and whatnot. So recognizing those challenges for students and teachers and building a certain kind of level of compassion or understanding when you know things get delayed or, or change and being transparent and flexible about that. And the third aspect that I wanted to talk about today is reflection. And this is really important for me just because I, I put it into actually one of my core principles for learning outcomes for my courses, which is to think about learning as an experience that's personally meaningful to you. And I think a lot now as kind of the, the key learning moments that I've had from like K through 12, as well as within college and graduate education, those moments where that really stick out to me are the ones that were personally meaningful. It wasn't like the necessary, the core content, but it was maybe like how the professor approached the content or how I was challenged to think in a way or I was pushed in a new role that I've never done before. And the second reason why reflection I believe is really important now is with this kind of online information overload moment, it's really hard to parse out the material that we've already covered. Um, it's already, it was already hard before. I mean, just like with the rigor of, of Brown and the different types of course material and, and different obligations that we have and commitments to like different like student groups or kind of different events and things like that. So it was just a way to build in the ability to reflect and parse out what we've covered. And these three aspects, I hope through my teaching, build this collective investment in both the course the environment as well as the outcomes. So what does this look like? Um, I wanted to take some time to just go over a few examples of what I've done. Um, and as I said before, in the link to um, the slides, uh, you could also click on and just reference the example questionnaires and, and charters and reference materials that I've created before. Um, and, and again, like feel free to recycle, reuse, remake them. I've done the same and I've built up and learned a lot from all of you. Some of this might look familiar just because some of you have, have used this, some of these, like the class charter, for example, in your classes. Um, and just to speak briefly about them. So these two, I thought were really the class charter and the class questionnaire. It was really important to just engage and design and think about the class basically reflective of who, who the class participants are. So before the class started, you know, with shopping period and then the changing platforms that was happening, that was happening in the fall, I sent out a pretty de detailed initial questionnaire to get a sense of what works for students. Are they having challenges with internet connectivity or are they able to have access to Zoom and, um, and Google and, and all of that? But also, what worked for them in the in the spring? Do they really hate Canvas? Do they is this um, do they not really look at announcements or or what worked? Like do they, do they really like breakout rooms? So that was just really helpful. Um, besides the technical aspects, just other types of questionnaire things like their background knowledge on this field, what they're excited for, and and a bit more um, kind of generative questions such as what makes a meaningful classroom environment for them. And then from there, I actually um, read that very closely. And then our first day of work, uh, sorry, first day of class, we built a class charter together, building off the responses from the questionnaire. So um, you can see from the class charter, then um, I could recompiled it and we built kind of a principles guide of what we wanted our class to look like. So those are a few modalities just to think about like shaping the class, but the one I wanted to demonstrate for um, today is actually thinking about um, a very historical example and one that I use pretty much every class because in historical classes where core to this is examining close readings. So I do this um, in breakout rooms and I'm going to just show the example now. Can you still see my screen okay? Okay, great. So this I actually worked with in my, um, in our, um, Colonial Indochina class, and I worked closely with the facilitators who helped to shape kind of the, the form of how this looked like. And this is in Google Jamboard. So it's jamboard.google.com, which uh, we at Brown have access to through Google. And what I did was we, um, I selected a text from the reading that they've already read, so it's familiar. Um, 
And I, before our class started, you know, we made this. So we had a text, we had some images. And then what I did, I actually have three of these for each of the three groups. And then I created breakout rooms. So this assignment took about 10 to 15 minutes only. So I created three breakout rooms. I explained the activity and that what we're going to do is we're gonna go into these three breakout rooms and closely analyze a text. And then we'll come back and we summarize and present what we discovered. And what's great about Jamboard, um, so I want this, this session to be really concrete, is it's very, um, I, I think it's very creative and intuitive. So if you feel like a pen, you can like select a different color and you can like highlight or you can circle things and you can see that the comments or the annotations are anonymous. So it creates kind of a nice low stakes environment so what I would have students do is I would take two, I would tell them in the first two minutes in your breakout room, just read the text. And while you're reading, you can annotate it. So, I mean, this is just erase if you feel like you messed up here. Um, you can highlight and circle. So I'll have, um, I'll have the students just silently read and annotate. So here you have a lot of students annotating here. And then afterwards, students, could regroup and then just talk about this text or talk about question. And in this other group here, which is really great, it seemed like they didn't really like to use the annotation. They like to use the sticky note. So I don't, so here you can see, um, you know, I'm adding a sticky note. I can change the colors, but I can just add a sticky note and X out that. And then I was like, I don't really understand what's going on here. And actually in this example, one of the students, that's what they said, which was really helpful too. It's just like, you know, I read this multiple times. I really don't know what this means. And as an instructor, um, you know, I, I have two ways in which I do this. What, sometimes I, I don't go into the breakout rooms. I let this that really be the student's space. Or if I do, I'm just kind of like quietly observing. But what's great is um, even if I'm not in the breakout room, I can still see all the post-it notes that are popping up through the Jamboard and to get a sense of, okay, when we regroup, we should pay attention to this quote because students are having difficulty understanding what's happening. And yeah, so I think in this group too, I, I, I think there were a lot of comments about like they would add quotes from the reading. Um, they would try to make sense of the text and, and, and making kind of a comment and you can move these post notes around as a group. And what's really great about Jamboard um, and combining this with breakout rooms is that you have two modalities you're working with. One, which is verbal, which is you're in a smaller group of which you can verbally talk with one another. And this could be a group about like five students, five or four students who are just like engaging with the text and talking through this. Um, sharing comments. Um, I, as a professor, might not be in there, so they could all students who might also feel better about just kind of sharing amongst themselves. Or also, if you feel like a little bit, you know, hesitant to share verbally too, there's also, um, you know, so many options to like engage with the text in a way that feels um, more low stakes. So I really love using Jamper for that reason. And then what happens is afterwards, I would close the breakout rooms and we would go back and I would have one person from each room resynthesize the ta one takeaway point from the breakout room activity. And that also helps to kind of set up the tone for the rest of our discussion. So that's an example of what I use in terms of just varying communication in terms of Jamboard. Um, well, you'll see, I'll do another Jamboard activity later on too, just in case that seemed a little overwhelming at first. Um, but I just, I love that one just because it was very visual and the student, the facilitators did a great job selecting the text too. So, okay, so back to the point two, energy management. And this one is pretty, again, I think I'm doing this as a reminder to myself, um, but in my syllabus, I also make a statement of how I designed the course. Um, just for me it's like both energy management but like transparency of what it means to be teaching right now and I you know I added a quote and I'm very much shaped by bell hooks and thinking about you know the challenges of teaching right now about limitations the well it's kind of this yearning of trying to understand but also the challenges of being in the course and 
and being together and what that means to be together online. So I had a few references here um, and I point to this in our first class. Um, in terms of just like practical aspects that I've done in my own class and you know what I've had to do is, as I mentioned before, it takes a lot of time to just communicate, explain, prepare everything. I feel like I've never written as many emails or Canvas announcements that I've in my life as I've done like the past three weeks, just because, you know, it's not just explaining things once, it's explaining things in like different forms and, and making things really clear, um, preparing. There's a lot of time and labor for this too. And because of that, um, I remind myself to cut at least 30% of readings and activities just because it's going to take more time to explain everything, to assign it, to go over it. Um, time management, I think like time awareness while you're synchronously teaching or asynchronously teaching is really difficult for me. Um, and one other point of advice that I've had when I attended this like independent publishing workshop is thinking about innovating in either form or content. Because when you innovate both, it's really jarring and very difficult to latch on to. So form, so that could be, I mean, right now we have to innovate in form and that, you know, we're teaching online and we're using different types of tools and resources. So then I try really hard to lessen my innovation in, in, in content. So if it is, it's like I'm cutting readings and if I decide to add another reading that I find is really, really important. For example, I try to add more readings, um, addressing race and class this semester specifically, then I'm going to reduce the other readings or I'm going to make it really, really kind of the core one or two readings that I think really epitomize that theme. So just, just containing my, <laughs> my enthusiasm to innovate or change the class just because it takes a lot of time to explain through everything. So that's energy management. And then thirdly is reflection. I think a lot about, um, I build in my class and one of the takeaway points and outcomes of our class is about reflecting on learning process and cultivation of lifelong learning. And these are quotes from my syllabus for my Colonial Indochina class. So as one of the outcomes, I, for me, it was so actually empowering as a student to be, become self-aware of my own learning process, to be active learners and participants, collaborative learners and participants in designing the course and thinking about the course and shaping my individual and collective learning going through the course. Um, so I, I, I push and create opportunities for students to think about their roles both as like learners, as peers, as they do peer, peer um, feedback and peer editing, for example, um, and thinking about their role also as a facilitator. I have students pair, this semester pair facilitate where they design um, and are in charge of coming up with a few discussion questions and activity for each week. Um, so, they're, they're at the, so they're divided up and then each of them pick one week to facilitate and then being building in moments of kind of reflecting upon what that means for them as a learner and as an individual as a peer and an example of this is this mid-semester portfolio reflection um i actually will just link or yeah i'll link to it um because i think it's a really interesting one and usually instead of um kind of um a mid, uh, what is it, a midterm where you're like evaluating knowledge, content and understanding in the middle of the semester. What I do is in the middle of the semester, we created a portfolio reflection. And I actually worked and designed this activity very closely with one of my Sprint students. So I'm very happy about this. Um, and what essentially the mid semester portfolio reflection has two goals. One is to just Kind of recalibrate and make sense of what have we covered in the first six weeks of class. Um, so I have students reflect back upon their assignments, their class, kind of the notes from our discussion, even um, communication or aspects on their Canvas discussion board, um, or a specific reading that they really enjoyed. And I'll have them curate three, three pieces from the, the six weeks of learning. Um, and then in each of the three pieces, I want them to I basically have them write like a three sentence reflection on what that meant for them as 
we have a student, how to just connect with course themes. And then the second goal that this achieves too is to be able to resynthesize and to make sense of what has stuck out to them um, in this first six weeks of class to help shape the final project. Because at this point we're transitioning the class and thinking about development of, you know, because we're learning all of this and the goal is to create some type of final research paper and, and that's for this capstone seminar. So what themes stuck out, um, what are, what's surprising, how have we kind of changed our way of thinking about colonial Indochina or colonialism, um, what aspects are missing possibly in the types of coverage that we've encountered in our readings. Um, is there something that really stuck out to me that I, like as a student, want to continue to do research on? So um, if you later, if you want to like, whoops, if you want to click on that link, it will show the example of, of the actual instructions. And again, like feel free to reuse or recycle, remix, cut parts of this activity that you find useful or not. Um, and these are the instructions. And I do this, I created this in the Google Doc. And these, these are the instructions. I, I spend a lot of time also explaining the purpose of assignments for students. And I tell this to them in the beginning of the semester too, where I hate busy work. I don't believe in busy work and I want to respect everyone's time as well. So I just, every assignment, I, I just spend a lot of time explaining why I did that assignment. Um, and these are just the instructions. And then these are a few of the examples, but I wanted to highlight, I highlighted a few that students curated that I thought were just visually really interesting. So this was the virtual Anchor project that Faze had mentioned that I worked with um, where students experienced a 13th century recreation of, of the Anchor metropolis through this digital humanities project. And it was, it was a whole teaching module that I had to reformulate for online teaching. And it, it, I think it worked. And I think what's great about this student um, was who really loved this is she juxtaposed the scenes that she experienced through the, the module and then her own photographs that she took in Cambodia when she traveled there in 2015. And this, this module is really useful in thinking about both historical representation, visual analysis, and also I paired this with a few historical texts about travel logs from a French and Cambodian perspective. And then you hear you have like a short reflection of the student had connecting it, you know, to the assignment. But I mean, this was not three sentences. Students often wrote a lot more than what I asked them to, um, which is fine and great. Um, and then the students are very like reflective about like their own person uh, positionality too, and thinking about what they, you know, their perceptions before and what it meant to go through the assignment. So that's um, just one example. And then, oops. So the other one that I, I really like and actually is a, um, another aspect of building and reflection is this one lingering question or one takeaway point. And um, essentially after every, every class, um, you know, I actually organically designed this when, when I was first trying to teach my free and power class in the, the spring and I was like oh wait we went over all this and like how do we conclude or how do we make sense of all this because it felt like all right time's up and then we leave but but I really wanted and, and it's something I'm still working on which is building in time for like conclusion so what we do is like so this is after um I'll click on this so after our um this was from our class on this, this past week on revolution and revolution, nationalism and, and communism in 1930s Indochina. So what I'll have students do is again, we'll take it to Jamboard. And um, I, I have this kind of this blank Jamboard. So I'll tell students, all right, in about one to two minutes, I want you to write either a question, like a lingering question you have or a takeaway point from our discussion. And then we'll just like quietly um, write uh, either a question or a takeaway point in here, what students did um, is they'll duplicate this and they'll, they might write something like, I still don't understand the difference between Marxism and socialism or something. And they'll, they'll save that. And again, these are anonymous, so they're really great um, in that way. And then other people will write some takeaway points. And then as I see them pop up, 
I can, I would encourage students like as you're, you know, wrapping up, if you already put your question or takeaway point, feel free to reply. So you can click this, you can duplicate this color and then they'll, they could try to reply. And then like, I think so. Um, and then they'll write a reply and they can put it next to, so you could actually move other people's post-it notes too. So it's actually really dynamic in that way. And then I'll also ask students like, feel free to like plus one to the ones that you're like really stick out to you. So they could like duplicate this. And then I'll be like, I really am sticking to this point. Um, so that's kind of how it looks like. And this is like at the end, what it looks like kind of a mess, but I think it was really great because I mean, I like it because I tried to keep the color coding because if not, it felt really overwhelming. But so the green points were the takeaway points and I pay attention to the yellow points just because if there's like something that I covered really quickly that I really need to address and I'll, and I'll read through them. Um, and then as you know, the students were also just circling things and drawing connections be between points as well. And then I would um, use that moment to like verbally resynthesize aspects. I would do that at the end of the class, or I would also mention and use this as, as kind of a platform for my next class to begin and craft my lecture for the next class. And this is like a really just helpful checkout activity. Some students get really excited and like, um, you know, draw uh, exclamation points or things that stick out to them really strongly. So, so this is Jamboard and as kind of way of conclusion, what I'm going to do now is I am going to copy this blank Jamboard here and I am going to share this to our chat and we're going to practice this. Um, so feel free to click the Jamboard link and I'll talk through this a little bit, but right now I can see um, groups that are joining the Jamboard. I'm going to stop share just so that we could experience and focus on the Jamboard that we have at hand right now. And what um, we're going to do now is essentially we're going to take two minutes to just silently write out a question or a takeaway point from this talk. And it could be also like a question, like a lingering question, something I didn't address, um, something that you know you had wanted to throw in the chat, but it didn't quite work out. Um, so let's just take a few minutes to, to do that. If there's any issues with um, uncertainty about how to duplicate, so I can, um, you basically can click duplicate over, if you click the, the three little menu bars, you can click duplicate, or if you want, you can also just make a new post-it note on the left menu bar. So it looks like we have over 15 people joining us right now. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> um, okay, so let's, I'll give you a few moments, just write. Cindy, just to confirm these questions, sticky notes are anonymous and confidential, correct? Yes, they are anonymous. Okay, thank you. I'm more comfortable asking my question though. Uh oh. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. It is, it, it's the one on what's the difference from what is it? <laughs> Sticking with that thing. Did it? What's that? I was just asking if it came out okay. Um... Yes, I see it. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like there's some questions that are coming up and some takeaway points. If you're done writing your question or your takeaway point, feel free to reply to other people's points too, or to add plus ones around things of which stick out to you. These are some great questions. Cindy, if you want to ask another question, do you press duplicate or I'm having trouble doing that? Yeah, so um, there's two ways you can do this. You could just click duplicate your post-it notes and that just, I mean, it duplicates the post-it note um, 
And then you can edit the post-it note so then it can change the text. Sorry, Cindy, again, I'm, I'm hoping these are questions others have as well. So pardon the interruption. I asked about the anonymity because what if you don't want it anonymous, uh, anonymous? What if you want, what if you want to hear from the students? And then, sorry to be cynical, but doesn't that enable potential problematic messages if it's anonymous? That's a really good question. Um, okay, so for the first part about like, if you want it to be, non-anonymous you could also just ask students to be like this is my and then you can have them sign it you know um as, as a way to do it like this is my question and then just have them sign it um is a way like i just popped up mine that's um in blue here i think the other question about like maybe if I, I haven't had an experience before, and I, I know that that's something that could happen. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to talk about like that, their own experience about like possibly um, kind of negative results from anonymity, but I, I also, I, I believe that I think if we, if you have like the class, like targeted enough in terms of what the question is, and then um, kind yeah. of even if, if that does come up, I think it's- like you, Cindy, I'm sorry. And I don't anticipate it would be a problem, honestly, but it's, it's possible I don't anticipate it on our campus. Yeah, and I think, no, I mean, I don't think, it, I think it's an important one. And I think I, I, I try really hard to just build up that community where, we don't have that issue but if it, it does happen i think it is a, an important moment to to address it um if if that does come up or to talk about um kind of online etiquette and like what type of feedback is useful or helpful and productive um so i i maybe i i haven't had that experience but i also don't think we should necessarily shy away from addressing it if it does come up um, so I'm just going to, what we're going to do now, I, I think, is to transition into to questions. Um, and first off, just to draw from kind of the questions that are here on this Jamboard. Um, I wanted to, let's see, the first question that I, thank you for all the plus ones around the thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, so question, so in yellow, how much time do you build in teaching students? how to use Jamboard and how do you factor in students joining a class after you've already have three or four meetings? I've definitely had that experience. And I think, uh, so the first part of that question, um, teaching students how to use Jamboard. I think I've actually noticed a few students were already using Jamboard in some of the other classes. So they knew practices, better than I did. I was like, wait, how did you change the background? Things like that. Um, so that was quite impressive. And then secondly, um, I think if I'm going to introduce a new tool, I'd only do one in each session. Like I wouldn't do like three sessions, three different tools in, in the class. Um, and I always give at least like a five to 10 minute buffer just so that students can, can ask questions. Um, I usually have some type of backup option just because I know some students were like having connectivity issues, especially if it's live um, and then they're like calling in. Um, and often like calling in through their phone or not able to use the chat. So I think allowing for some options to like verbally contribute if necessary or, um, or sending a chat message. So that's something that I, I try to think um, in when I'm developing like a new, new tool just because it takes a lot of time and there could be always kind of some issues. And then Students joining a class after you've had three or four meetings. I have a few students experience that too. And I think it's really just, it's hard just because you're already starting to build up community and, and spending time um, to talk through like expectations. So I had, um, because the first few sessions were recorded via Zoom. So I asked students to, to catch up, to watch. Um, usually it was like my first 
class Zoom session because that sets out class expectations to read through the syllabus and then come to set up a time in office hours with me to talk through the specifics of the class to catch up. Um, and that's generally what I've done. And I've been a little bit more kind of flexible about what type of assignments. I try to get students caught up as quickly as possible. Um, sometimes that means like skipping a few assignments, but it's hard. And I think with shopping period and everything too, I think it's it's been a challenge and I'm just working that on a case by case basis. Does anybody want to verbally um, comment or raise a question either from Jamboard or or any of the observations they've noticed on the Jamboard before we move on to other open-ended questions? If there's nobody raising their hand, Cindy, I can add a, one of my questions, additional questions. Uh, it pertains to hybrid classes, which, as you know, will be continuing in the spring, uh, likely into the summer, who knows, maybe into fall as well. And, um, you know, one of the common setups that a lot of our colleagues are doing is um, splitting the, the class into uh, an in-person, so half the class, say there's uh, 20 students and it's a seminar, so 10 students come in um, on Tuesdays or that, the, sorry, say it's a lecture class of 40 students, which is beyond the 19 threshold at Brown after which it has to be online. So what some colleagues do is they'll take, uh, let's say 19 students um, online on Tuesdays and then the other half is doing it online and then switch on Thursday. Do you have anything to say about that and what these, um, these device, these technologies and, um, you know, opportunities might provide for that, both challenges and opportunities? Yeah, that's a great question. And I myself haven't taught a hybrid class. Um, the advice I received um, from like a instructional technologist specialist was telling me to think about the, still thinking about, um, the online or asynchronous, like using Canvas and discussion boards as still kind of the core part of a class. And then any in-person elements as more like summative or synthesis cl uh, class, group, class group work or, or kind of um, maybe more like creative opportunities to engage with material as like that as more like adding on and furthering the discussion or the content that was delivered um, asynchronously or through lecture videos or through online and Canvas discussion boards. And the reason for that is more about um, accessibility and inclusion, just so that people are on the same kind of like level playing ground in terms of accessing the material and feeling like, oh, I at least like experienced like the lecture in the same way. Um, that is just because I wasn't there in person, I like missed things or, or felt like it, it was kind of a disconnect. So that was like one advice that I've received. And I guess that's, uh, for me, that's still very abstract because I haven't had to do it myself. But the experience I have had is because my students are, I mean, my class is all online, but I have many students that could not meet in the primary synchronous sessions that's on Wednesdays from one to three. So I created a discussion drop-in section for those who can't make it to the one to 3 p.m. class on Thursdays, very late at 8 p.m. And one challenge I'm experiencing there is, you know, I have the students that regularly come because they can't come to the, the Wednesday class. Um, and at times I'm struggling, like, do I just duplicate the material that I covered on Wednesday? Do they watch the Zoom video where we, like, what role does that, that discussion section have? So that's one part. And the second part is I also, it's open. So students who basically wanted to have to further the discussion from the Wednesday class or just wanted to drop in to talk about final projects or a topic that they're interested in are also welcome to come. And I wanted that just to build that bridge between the, the students that essentially are in like a different time zone or can't make it for whatever reason and feel like they're always catching up to the students that get the kind of are part of more of the core part of class. 
Um, but I'm still struggling a lot. And I think I'm trying, you know, this is what week nine, week 10, now that I'm just like re-articulating the purpose of that 8 p.m. class or 8 p.m. session. And for me, the purpose, like, and I'm going to tell it to my students, okay, are there students in this class here right now? <laughs> but um, that I'm gonna tell them like, you know, the purpose of that is really to resynthesize and to be like a formal, like an informal discussion section to raise questions. I will still like have, my takeaway point. And actually, um, I would use the Jamboard from the Wednesday class, though the one takeaway point and one lingering question as kind of a starting ground for our for our 8 p.m. class. And this doesn't really answer your question, but it has to do with like the kind of like the two separated groups and trying to build community across, um, which is which is a struggle, I have to say. Um, did Cindy, did we did you get all the questions on the Jamboard? Just um, wanted to uh, draw your attention to those because those are there are a few I think that we missed maybe. Sure, um, I, and then I I think I had just wanted to pose if anyone wanted to verbally pose. Oh, that's right. Yeah, pose that as well. But I can also answer a few too. Uh, I don't know if I in the next ten minutes could answer the difference between capitalism and liberalism. Yeah, that was obviously. <laughs> I was just testing it. Uh, I don't know. Maybe Madeline can help me too. I see there's and, and who else is here who can give me a hand on that. Um, <laughs> have you ever surveyed registered students before shopping period? Yes. So that was the questionnaire that I was referring to. And actually on that note, I'm also going to, this is actually on my, um, the slides, the link to my slides as well. But I wanted to just re- send this out so you can have an example of like the questionnaires and things that I sent to my students before our class. And it's, I mean, this is a, this is a chunk of chat text with a bunch of links. So feel free to copy this into like your text, no editor or open it up and just save it for reference. Um, and so I've definitely surveyed students and it's hard because like I survey them and then maybe only a fifth end up staying in the class. So I also have to like filter through that survey and figure out like how to take that feedback to adapt the class, but also remember that like the class might change and students might change and um, to remember what my own personal core goals for the class was. Um, and then have you used Jamboard for asynchronous teaching rather than live? Let's see, I, I haven't. Um, what I do is, but that's a really, I want, I want to, and I actually, like, sometimes I would just screenshot this, the Jamboard as, like, a, like, and become a, an image, and then um, one thing I wanted to do is just to post it onto um, our Canvas, and then have students respond to it there, too, or have it, like, as a starting point for a Canvas discussion board. Um, I use Google Docs, asynchronously before where like especially if students that um, missed the synchronous session so they can read through and they can answer almost like a worksheet like answer some of the questions that were posed there or add their own comments and with that example that I, since I'm just mentioning it um, you might want to note the facilitation guide that I linked out because I added a few notes too so you can see how I build in like kind of almost like creating a worksheet for class and then having students follow along and then guiding them and, and, and incorporating um, kind of answering questions through there. And then any thoughts about how to scale some of these practices to a larger lecture format? Um, that's something that I don't have personal experience with, but, but I think through like shared and anchor, I've just been learning, especially with students or with classes that are like lecture classes. Um, I think, I think in terms of scale, it's important to, um, I mean, there's, there's ways to do this either by, I know on discussion boards, you can also split them, split the class up into kind of different groups or, or, or like smaller like study groups that, that you've kind of followed throughout the class. Um, and then I think for like other aspects, I mean, I, I think the other 
the, the, the takeaway point regarding, regarding like reflection and as well as energy management is definitely needs, should be scaled into thinking about um, in lecture format. I know that others um, in larger lecture format um, just use the discussion board extensively and a good amount of time. Like I do, I've created a like very few um, lecture videos just because my class is a seminar and I haven't really had to do that. Um, but I, we use our discussion board quite a lot and I leave that space. Um, I mentioned this before in another um, setting, but I think discussion boards on Canvas are really useful um, just to have students engage with the text and one another. And I treat it a little bit like, the way I approach it is slightly different from other instructors where I actually don't engage as much on discussion board, unless there's like a very clear clarification question. And then what, what I use for the discussion board is I would kind of quote or draw out like some, some of the questions or engagements that like student A and B have. And then I could bring that into my lecture to start their next class. So then it feels like there's more of a connection between asynchronous, which is the canvas, and then either the lecture or synchronous. So we're just uh, over 11.50 mark. I know some of us have to leave or have left already for other meetings, but uh, Cindy has been gracious enough to make herself available till 12. So uh, we'll just stay online till then. If there are any other questions, um, please feel to just jump in um, or type it in the chat. Cindy, you actually, while people are thinking, if they have a final question, you brought up a really important issue that many of us, if not all of us, are dealing with in our teaching um, in this time. And that is specifically um, rationing out time, very, very valuable and important time for one-on-one -on -one meetings, which is a type of engagement that is obviously very important. And we usually reserve for office hours. Um, and for many of us, that has become a way of balancing um, the somewhat distant and even dehumanizing aspects of Zoom online, but it poses a challenge on questions of timing, even the faculty members labor, because if you have 40 students in your class and you're doing individual meetings with all of them, that's far, we're gonna go far beyond uh, the, the usual two hours per week or whatever. I just wanted to insert that in there, not necessarily for you to answer. I think it raises difficult questions on the university level of um, for us to think uh, think about. And I just wanted to throw it out, out to all colleagues um, if they have thoughts or suggestions. Um, and some of them are potentially controversial because how do you weigh a one-on-one, -on -one, the value of a one-on-one -on -one meeting? To me, it, that is almost just as important as meeting with the lecturing in front of the entire class. But you obviously can't do that at the same time. So just some issues of equity and, and practicality also, uh, I think we're all dealing with that um, and will for the next few semesters, it seems. Do you have any thoughts on that, Cindy, or anybody else? I wanted to hear if anyone else had a thought before I jump in or had experience with this. Because for me, I'm speaking primarily from a a place where I, I only have 18 students. That being said, I, I, I do meet with my previous students too. So I feel like I, I don't know how many students I have sometimes. Um, I think in terms of equity, as part of the final project, I do require students to meet with me one-on-one -on -one just because it's really easy to glue. I mean, I only have 18 students and I'm already like, I haven't had a chance to engage with a few students either because of connectivity or they haven't been as you know, vocal in class or participating on Canvas. So I, I, I feel like I lose a few students really easily and, and it's that distance that I, I worry about. So I do require at least one one-on-one -on -one meeting and that's like the specifics of getting our final project through. Um, on a logistical front too, I, um, Ha, like through Google Calendar, you can also set up appointment slots where students sign up for an appointment slot. And right, I had to change it. It was 20 minutes. Now I've shortened it to 15, which feels really rushed. Um, but I think it's just a really nice way to check in with students. Um, 
I have to say every week all my appointment slots are full and I am starting to add more appointment slots as I move on throughout the weeks and they're doing their final projects. The discussion, the drop-in discussion at 8 p.m. that I have is also another place where I, every week I encourage students to come in. I know some don't feel as comfortable because it's a group, but I think it's just another chance to have a different, like somewhat organic meeting and like face-to-face -face time. Um, I um, also, like after our class, like one thing I wanted to mirror is like, you know, after a class concludes, you have that students are like packing up and leaving and like little banter. And even though we're done, we can still kind of talk or share kind of news. So I'm trying to model that too, in a way where like after, if something does end at 12, I'll, I say like, oh, I, I'm gonna stop recording. I can hang out for a little bit if anyone wants to like share any updates or ask any questions. Um, or anything like that and then or like throw things in the chat and usually that does happen sometimes students are still also like thanking each other and like saying like great job like so there's like moments of connection that happen there too which i think is helpful uh, on that very note we can actually model that right now because i'm going to stop the recording uh we're at 12 and so i want to thank first and foremost our speaker dr cindy nguyen for a uh, very provocative stimulating and uh, i think series of helpful examples and uh, ideas. Um, so I've stopped recording.